Mm -hmm. Oh, you're okay. Start. Okay, great. Uh, don't use this microphone. You have to open the. I see, but this one. Yeah, well, to well. connect the monitor. I don't know why. Okay. Oh, I see. Zoom was muted here. I have unmuted. Oh, I see. It, it was muted. Right. Okay. I don't Thank know you. why. Maybe you muted from here. Uh, Okay. Okay. Clarity. It works now. Thank if you. you. Have to talk with him. Please use the mic. Okay. Not your own. Ah, oh, this one. I see. Oh, yeah. So I was on this one. It's okay. Okay. But not your computer. Because right. Right. I see. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. It seems to work now. Uh, let me let me again so so there are more people in the audience let me introduce the speaker once again it's a pleasure to introduce professor dmitry maslov from university of florida who will be talking about transport properties of correlated electron systems you can take from here dmitry thank you Tigran. Uh, i should probably thank the organizers of this conference for letting me uh, talk here uh, being one of them uh, i wished i could be present in Trieste, uh, but circumstances didn't work out. So hence uh, Zoom. Uh, I'm sure that this is going to be a wonderful uh, conference and you'll have a good time sen uh, scientifically and, and otherwise. Uh, I know that you had a long day. Uh, you had uh, tutorials about uh, SYK model, superconductivity, simply protected phases. This is all very complicated, and I'm going to uh, talk about a, a few simple things, including the second law, do the formula, and all uh, this stuff, so you can uh, relax and view it as a transition to a uh, sea swimming session uh, in the afternoon. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through this, but this is my uh, uh, favorite list uh, of sources on transport, uh, and because the talk uh, will be somewhere do the we'll, we'll post it somewhere, uh, you can look it up, and, th and this is where I usually go to uh, if I need to uh, read something. Else. Okay, so we'll start with uh, 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 a general statement that one of the most serious challenges in condensed matter is that a large number of conducting compounds, not necessarily metals, do not confirm to the predictions of the thermodynamic field. And uh, the transport data are perhaps the most extensive and abandoned because we have uh, various uh, means here. We can measure DC resistivity, we can measure magnetic resistance, hole, we can do optical conductivity. But it's notoriously difficult to interpret. And the reason now that there are uh, additional conservation laws, uh, namely uh, of momentum and current, and the result which we see if we're not an existing property of a thermoliquid or a non thermoliquid that matter, but it depends on coupling to external degrees of freedom, uh, such as impurities and phonons. So the outline of the talk will be that I will first briefly uh, remind you of the thermality theory and how it breaks down at a particular quantum critical point. And then uh, we'll talk how to discuss how to uh, relate this property, uh, this, uh, uh, this feature to transport properties. We'll talk about unplug scattering and then paper scattering uh, in the metals, and then about optical conductivity on convex and concrete thermal surfaces. Okay, so start, start, start starting from uh, the 50s, uh, the idea uh, of Landau thermoliquid uh, is certainly very much familiar uh, to everyone, but let me remind you that uh, uh, it's based on the notion uh, that when uh, two electrons or two fermions interact, uh, and uh, they, uh, they are in the regime of degeneracy, uh, it means that they have to uh, compete uh, for uh, the narrow intervals of, uh, of the energy space, in the energy space, which are widths of temperature uh, near the permeable issue. And uh, as a result, the scattering trade, which is proportional to scattering probability, is proportional not only to the nominal cross section. Uh, of these two particles as, they, as if they were interacting in a vacuum, to, to a statistical factor, uh, which comes from a Pauli principle. And the final temperature, just multiplying these two factors of temperature, we get a factor of T squared, and if we do it uh, for a particle which is at energy omega uh, uh, above the, or below the Fermi energy, 
then it, it is extended into a symmetric form and it is squared plus pi squared to square. And so what it tells us that if we go to the lower energies, uh, then uh, quasi particles are essentially free and a bunch of strongly interacting uh, particles, such as helium three atoms or electrons in a metal, can be replaced by quasi particles with different masses, different G factors, which interact on the weak at lower energies. And this is beautifully demonstrated uh, by um, uh, the notion of viscosity. Just to remind you what, what viscosity is, basically the pneumatic viscosity uh, in a gas uh, is the same as the diffusion coefficient. In, 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 in classical gas, such as air, uh, it's given by the product of the uh, RMS uh, thermal velocity and the free pass. The linear free pass is fixed by the by the distance between the molecules and uh, the cross section, while the velocity is uh, proportional to the square root uh, of t, uh, and therefore the velocity of gas is supposed to scale as square root of t, and this is indeed uh, confirmed, let's say, for air here. But if you think that classical liquid is anything like uh, classical gas, just this higher density will be totally uh, wrong. Because viscosity of classical liquids follows a totally different law. Uh, it's actually an Arrhenius law. And here is viscosity for water. And this is because the, uh, air, uh, the molecules of classical liquid um, cannot travel long distances. There is no motion of the pass. And if we want to talk about nuclear pass here, this nuclear pass uh, is on the. Sorry, Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri, can I ask you to speak louder? Sure. Uh, I can make sound on my screen. Okay. Now, in a quantum Fermi liquid, viscosity is like or in a classical gas, except for now it is a quantum gas. It's still the diffusion coefficient of fermions. Now the velocity is the Fermi velocity, so it's temperature independent. And the mean free pass is proportional uh, to uh, the mean free time, and this is the inverse. Uh, T squared factor of temperature. So some, something really neat happens here. If you think, for example, of helium-3, that's a liquid. Uh, uh, it means that the distance between uh, the helium-3 atoms is, is of the same order uh, as uh, the size of the atoms uh, uh, itself. Yet, due to the power principle, the mean free pass is much longer than the separation between the atoms. So a particle starting here, will fly over long distances before a collision event will happen. Uh, this is viscosity uh, of helium-3 measured back in the 1950s, uh, which follows one of the squared law. And this is more recent measurements of another uh, Fermi liquid in graphene. Uh, this is from uh, Andre Game Group, where it also follows uh, one, of the, one of the squared law. Okay, so uh, the thermal liquid scattering rate, um, which I uh, mentioned before, uh, can be obtained in the perturbation theory, but it can also be up, uh, can also be obtained uh, 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 for any order in the in the interaction, and this was done by Lattinger and Village back in the early sixties. Question uh, is, uh, what do we mean? when we say that it's valid at low frequencies and low temperatures. So formally speaking, they go to zero, but we know that physics uh, doesn't know zeros. So we need to ask how small a medium T should be. And naively, they should be smaller than the Fermi energy. Uh, it's a necessary condition, but not always sufficient. And uh, to see what the actual condition is, let's do a quick calculation in the Fermi golden rule where I will consider scattering of uh, two fermions uh, depending on the P and P and to, to final states uh, these different momenta. And I will choose an interaction to be of this type. And it may remind you of a screen Coulomb potential in three dimensions, uh, but I will use it in uh, dimensions two and three and I will tell you why a bit later. Okay, so Fermi golden rule, contains uh, uh, integrals uh, over energy transfer between the fermions, and it's limited by temperature by power statistics. Over the energy 
of the second fermion is an NP, also limited by, uh, by uh, Pauli statistics. There is an angular integral. We need to integrate over the momentum transverse with the square of the, uh, of the scattering potential. And then there are, there are two delta functions uh, which represent energy R conservation. So because I have two integrals here, which are bounded by temperature, I already have that with the of the square. Uh, and therefore, if I want to keep this up result to be proportional to the squared, uh, the frequency should disappear from this formula because otherwise it will change it. Uh, how can we make sure that uh, uh, it can disappear? Well, suppose that the typical momentum transfers are much smaller than the fermion momentum, then I can, then, then I can expand the difference of dispersions to first order in Q, and then I can up neglect uh, the energy transfer if it is much smaller than thermal velocity times typical momentum transfer. And because frequency is over the temperature, this is the same to say that temperature is much smaller than Vf times typical momentum transfer. After that, each of the integrals uh, of the local function of the angle gives me a factor of one with u from here. And then if we do a power counting with our interaction, we'll end up with uh, scaling here. And this parameter psi minus one, which I chose to parameterize the uh, uh, mass uh, of the, my bosonic field, will enter uh, the exponent six min minus d. At the same time, we'll see that uh, typical uh, momentum transfers are of, of, of the order of psi to minus one. Okay, so what we'll have here is a nice formula. We have our t squared factor, but we have this three factor psi to six minus d. And if this is, uh, uh, if this parameter psi minus one is of the order of kf, then the condition to have this formula uh, work is that temperature is just much smaller than the thermal energy. That's what I was assuming from uh, the very beginning. But what happens if this parameter psi becomes very large, goes to infinity, surely this formula cannot survive. And this is one of the way to observe a breakdown of the thermal liquid. Uh, as a corollary, I'll mention that it can also happen. Uh, 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 the deviation from the T-squared um, dependence happens even in a textbook case of a screen pooling gas. In this case, the parameters of the, uh, the interaction, the prefactor lambda is proportional to the square of the charge. Psi minus one is just the inverse of screen radius, which at the coupling is much smaller than RKF. And so the condition for the, for the thermal liquid to work would be the temperature is much smaller than the plasma frequency, which by itself is much smaller than the Fermi energy. And if temperature is larger than the plasma frequency, less than the Fermi energy, actually we wouldn't have a Fermi liquid R behavior. Uh, the scattering rate would be proportional to temperature. But we're not interested in uh, cooling gas, but we're really interested in a situation when we can arrange for long range and preferably divergent range in an interaction. And this happens uh, uh, near uh, second order of quantum phase transition into phase with spatially uniform order parameter, which can be, for example, um, a ferromagnet or a pneumatic. So if I talk about ferromagnets, what happens is that uh, on the right of the screen, we are far away from uh, the quantum critical point. The accumulation length is short on the order of the interacting distance. As we start to tune our system towards this red dot, which is the R quantum principle point, the accumulation length increases, and finally, formally diverges at the quantum principle point. Okay, and the scenario which I just described here is known as Hertz-Miller's z equal to three R criticality. And in more a bit formal terms, one can say that we have a system of fermions, R with directly some bosons. I made them scalar uh, for simplicity. These bosons by itself are characterized by um, susceptibility, which is of the Ornstein alternative form. And this Ornstein alternative form contains the acceleration lens. Uh, and this is the effective interaction which I would want uh, my electrons to interact with. And then the electrons are coupled to bosons. In a kind of RPA scheme, you can uh, see that the effective susceptibility will be dressed by the electron polarization bubbles. 
And that means that the susceptibility of this process will be the bare bosonic susceptibility minus the equalization bubble of uh, thermals. And one property of this bubble is that if you go to frequencies which are much smaller than typical Q, this is a damping term or a dull damping term, which is omega o over Q. At verticality, when psi is equal to up infinity, it drops out. And then we see that scaling tells us that Q is proportional to, uh, uh, to omega to one third. That's why it's called Z equal to three. So the dynamical exponent uh, is equal to three. And then crossover between a thermal liquid and thermal liquid regimes and non thermal liquid regimes occurs at energies which by itself is proportional to psi minus three. Okay, or it means that I can replace psi minus one to, a, 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 to omega by one third if I want to go to a critical. So if I go back to my Fermi Golden Roof formula, I had a factor of t squared. Now the divergent correlation ends. Will be, in, uh, will be inversely proportional to temperature to, to the power of one third. And that would give me a non thermally exponent of uh, the scattering rate, which is d over three, which means that it is a linear in three dimensions and it's two thirds in, in, in two dimensions. So this is just a quantum lifetime, quantum scattering rate, which is the width or the peak in the, in the spectral function to which, uh, or, or, uh, uh, which can be measured in photo image. So at any fine uh, correlation length, if I, if I, if I, if, if I sit, uh, let's say here, uh, at some distance from the, from at the quantum critical point, if I would go down in temperature, then I would first measure the spectral rate, which has a non thermal liquid form, t to the exponent of d over three, and then it would cross into a thermal liquid uh, regime uh, for temperatures below this line. If, and if I'm just at the quantum critical point, well, then the thermal liquid is gone. I would never see this graph. This is all wonderful. How to relate these uh, results to transport? So I will start with level minus one. So uh, life is complicated. Solids are complicated. They have complicated thermal therm therm surfaces. What happens if we uh, replace our uh, metal by a single parabolic band at the gamma point and uh, this upper spectrum, which is proportional to a square? Well, uh, we better don't do it because uh, by doing so, we said that our system is Grillian invariant. And as it happens in Grillian invariant systems, internal forces do not affect the motion of the center of mass. So we can take, for example, two drops of liquid, water and honey, and uh, they have totally different viscosity. And the viscosity of water is much smaller than that of honey. But if we let them drop, they will be moving to the same uh, acceleration because uh, the gravity force and G will be acting from the center of mass, regardless uh, uh, of how strongly the molecules of liquid interact with each other. We can do another high school experiment. We can place same drops onto an incline with some rough surface. Well, in this case, the uh, drop of honey will not probably move at all, but the water drop can move given that uh, the incline is large enough. But in, in this case, its acceleration will be determined not only by the cooling force, which is gravity, but also by friction in between the surface uh, of the incline and of the drop. All right, so if we try to translate it into physics of solid, so we have a bunch of electrons here, uh, which we replaced by the Lillian invariant system. Well, why electric field? Well, what's going to happen that the momentum of the center of mass will be uh, directed opposite to the field because electrons are negatively charged, but the internal forces will not have Will, will not have any, any, any effect on the motion of the center of mass. And the momentum of the center of mass in magnitude will just increase linearly with respect to uh, uh, this time, which means that we wouldn't be able to establish any uh, kind of steady state. If we try to describe this situation uh, at the level of linear upper response, we'll have to conclude that our conductivity, the real part of it is actually uh, 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 infinite at zero frequency and zero otherwise. And this 
would work for any frequency, any temperature, which can change the uh, interactions and the whole viscosity. Okay, now we can introduce lattice. But similar to the case of uh, friction between the incline and the water drop, conductivity on lattice will be certainly finite, but it may be controlled by friction. That is forces which are external to the system of electrons, which can be phonons, impurities, et cetera. And what we want out, out of this, uh, this measurement is to extract uh, the information about electron-electron interaction. And uh, so, uh, 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 so we need uh, to understand under what conditions uh, uh, electron-electron interactions can control uh, the conductivity by themselves without help of external agents. Okay, so this was level number uh, minus one. If we go, suppose that we somehow uh, uh, found this abrasion and the level zero will recall of a uh, Rude formula, uh, which contains uh, for the resistivity, I'll write it in an upside down form for the resistivity rather than for the conductivity. And the resistivity is proportional to some, uh, to some, uh, to some scattering frame. And if I, replace this uh, scattering rate by the quantum scattering rate, which we, uh, which we estimate uh, using the Fermi Golden Rule, we'll conclude that the resistivity of Fermi liquid scales is squared. And if we're in a non-Fermi liquid regime, then it has this uh, non-Fermi liquid exponent d over three. Okay, um, that's probably also the graph uh, of an approximation because through the formula uh, is supposed to work even for entirely uh, classical systems and therefore it cannot contain quantum time. So we can look at a more complicated example. Uh, for example, we can take Boltzmann equation uh, for electrons which are moving in the presence of disorder such that the uh, relation function of disorder has finite range. Uh, that's about the only both equation we can solve. And what we'll learn from here is that the proper time which enters uh, the conductivity is not a quantum time, but what is called transport time, which contains the integral over the, uh, uh, over the scattering angle, over the scattering probability, multiplied by the transport factor, uh, which eliminates uh, uh, collisions uh, with small uh, angle. Uh, if the scattering is isotropic, uh, then the average of cosine here vanishes. So quantum time and transport time are the same. If uh, the scattering probability is picked uh, at a zero angle, then we expand our cosine. We get a factor of theta squared, which is related to momentum transfer. And then we we'll conclude that uh, one over tau transport is uh, suppressed compared to one over tau quantum. So this is supposed to be tau quantum in proportion to uh, smallness of momentum transfers. It also works for phonons. Uh, for example, for electron phonon um, interaction at uh, temperatures much smaller than uh, the Dubai frequent, uh, than the Dubai temperature. Typical momentum transfers are small. They are of the order of the um, momentum of a thermal phonon, temperature of a speed of sound. And one of the quantum time scales is TP, and one of the tau transport scales is TP5, and the difference is precisely the square of the typical moment. Okay, if we do similar procedure for our nearly acoustical thermal liquid, we know that typical momentum transfers are of the order of the inverse of relation lengths. So we need to multiply our quantum time by uh, a factor of Q squared. In the thermal liquid, we still uh, 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 have a T squared scaling, but now the dependence on psi is different. And if we do our smooth crossover to um, uh, non thermal liquid behavior, the exponent for the transport time changes to t to d plus 2 over t. Okay, so then this is, would be our uh, first order predictions. We would expect that uh, the resistivity of a thermal liquid, so, sorry, of a thermal liquid, uh, not, not, not a non thermal liquid, scales as t squared. Uh, if we have a non fermi liquid of this type in three dimensions, then the exponent is five thirds. And if we have a non fermi liquid in uh, two dimensions, then it scales as four thirds. 
Uh, we can do a similar analysis for the optical conductivity. And then again, I uh, will use the Bruder formula uh, for the conductivity, for the real particles of the conductivity at our finite frequency. Um, and then I will make a convergent argument that if I know the transfer time at finite temperature, then the transfer time at finite frequency will be just obtained by replacing uh, temperature by frequency. And then I will also take the conductivity into the high frequency regime when frequency is much larger than the scattering rate. In this case, the formula will give me uh, uh, something which is proportional to omega squared and one over tau transfer. And then again, by the same logic, I will have a constant optical conductivity in a Fermi liquid, which is known as Fermi liquid food. In three dimensions, uh, the conductivity would scale as omega to minus one third, and in two dimensions, it would scale as omega to minus two thirds. And the rest of the talk will be about the conditions under which this can be met, because it wouldn't be very cold. All right, so uh, we want the conductivity which is controlled solely by electron electron interactions. It doesn't mean that it is dominated by the electron electron interactions because some other sources can also contribute, but we want the situation when at least electron electron interactions are allowed to control the conductivity. And the answer in bulk samples is that, well, we need two uh, cases. If you're talking about DC uh, resistivity, this is possible only if we have either unclubs, which I'll talk about later, or compensated bands. For the optical conductivity, uh, the conditions are somewhat uh, uh, less uh, destructive. Uh, it will be controlled by the electron electron interactions in the presence of unclubs, compensated bands, but also for non parabolic bands. Uh, and by non parabolic, I mean non ellipsoidal. Ellipsoids wouldn't do because you can move them back. Uh, into uh, spheres. And uh, if I talk about uh, uh, smaller samples, uh, so let's say metal wires with rough walls, uh, then there are other situations. One can, uh, one can have a situation when you have an obvious stops flow of viscous electron liquid. I, I got predicted by Guruji in 1968, um, and I believe that Alex Levchenko uh, will tell you more about this on Friday. Or you can have a uh, uh, hydrodynamic flow in systems with very long, long range disorder, as was shown by Andrei Pilson and Spiva in 2011. I will focus on bulk samples from this point on. And so, as the first condition, I mentioned unclubs. Unclubs is a notion which uh, uh, was introduced by Google Files. I then analyzed the thermal conductivity of insulators, and then later on, uh, Landau and Penrenchuk. Um, introduce it into uh, the electron transport. And the word literally means jumping over uh, in German. Uh, so we have electrons on a lattice. The momentum is not a good R quantum number. What we have is a quasi momentum, and the momentum conservation can be obeyed up to uh, an arbitrary number of uh, reciprocal of lattice vectors, which is B. So if we don't have the reciprocal of like this vector on the right hand side, this is known as normal process, which conserves the momentum as if what is absent. And if n is not equal to zero, then it is an unclub. And uh, normal processes normally don't contribute to resistivity. Unclub processes give you uniformly liquid with this clear uh, scale. So uh, how we see that uh, we need unclubs, uh, I will need to uh, briefly introduce the Boltzmann equation because that's one way to see it. There are other ways. Uh, the Boltzmann equation is basically a legal equation for the distribution function uh, under the direction of a classical force. And the, uh, the effects of scattering um, uh, of electrons from each other, uh, from phonons, apparatus, et cetera, are parameterized by what is known as a collision integral. And for the case of electron electron um, interactions, the collision integral uh, has this gold, Fermi Golden Rule uh, form. Uh, you have scattering probability from the initial state to final state. This bunch of Fermi functions uh, simply uh, 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 impose uh, the uh, Pauli principle. 
And uh, this is momentum conservation uh, constraint, uh, and this is the energy conservation constraint. So uh, if we have uh, time independent uniform deep electric field, then we expect that uh, the deviations from equilibrium are very small. In this case, first of all, we don't have a time derivative, we don't have any special uh, gradient, and the fourth term uh, is uh, produced to the dot product between the electric field and uh, the velocity. And we can now uh, linearize uh, our nonlinear Boltzmann equation by expanding the distribution function around uh, the uh, around uh, the equilibrium uh, uh, Fermi function. And we can just choose parameterization that uh, the new non equilibrium function is called G. So if we do so, uh, the collision integral will take uh, a much simpler uh, linear form. And the um, combination uh, of uh, the non equilibrium parts uh, of F will enter in this linear form, uh, which will be the sum of two J's uh, in, the, in the initial state uh, minus the sum of two J in the final state. Okay, so why do we need, in general, umplots in order to uh, maintain finite conductivity in, in, the, in, the, in the details? So suppose that I have lattice, I have arbitrary um, dispersion. Uh, my velocity is some gradient uh, of uh, 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 my band, uh, and it's not equal to uh, momentum divided by mass, so I don't impose any constraints on the, on the lattice, but I disallow umplots uh, for a second. And then in a single band system, uh, electron electron interactions alone cannot control uh, the DC conductivity function. So, why is it so? So, what we need to solve is uh, this uh, integral equation uh, on function G. Once we know G, we know everything. And suppose we found a solution. Let's call this G1. But I notice that because momentum is conserved, I can add a scalar product between. Uh, momentum K and some arbitrary vector C to this solution. And this will be again a solution because the added term uh, will vanish the uh, collision integral. Now, this vector C is completely arbitrary. Its magnitude can be infinitely large, and therefore the conductivity or current can be infinitely large, and the conductivity can be arbitrarily at large. Uh, even if I apply it because of small electronic field. So that means that the conductivity still remains its delta function term as it was for the case of the Galilean invariant system. And the only difference is that it's now uh, anisotropic, so it uh, 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 has some Andrew weight, uh, which knows about uh, the symmetry of lattice. And another way to see it is that. Uh, in the system with uh, conserved momentum, the integral of the collision integral with momentum vanishes. And I can just take this equation, multiply it by the momentum and, in, and integrate, and, and it will give me momentum conservation law uh, by which uh, the uh, time derivative for the momentum will be proportional to the total uh, force acting on all of my electrons. And that means that, that, that the momentum of the system will move um, under the action of all this force and there will be nothing to stop. So what I gave you is one way to see the, the necessity are for umplots. There is another way uh, that follows straightly uh, from the Kubo formula, which was done by Maybachi and Okuyama. And for people more familiar with the memory matrix formalism, this is a statement about the existence of zero mode uh, of the memory matrix. All right, so we need them plus, and the plus um, can occur under two conditions. Uh, one is that the Fermi surface is large enough, and this is kind of obvious because uh, of what we need to satisfy is that uh, the mismatch between the final and the initial momenta has to be on the order of the uh, has to be equal to, to, to the reciprocal uh, lattice vector, which is on the order of uh, the inverse of lattice constant. So if I have a tiny Fermi surface, uh, let's say at the gamma point of the brilliant zone with size B, then all momenta on the Fermi surface are much smaller than the size of the brilliant zone and I cannot satisfy it. I need to go for states which are away from the Fermi surface, but there are only few of them. 
And as a result, resistivity is fine, but it is suppressed exponentially. So here's an example uh, uh, of an OOPA process on a honeycomb lattice, uh, which we'll certainly hear more about uh, in uh, uh, the second week of this workshop. So imagine that I have a toy model where I have a honeycomb lattice such as for graphene. It is doped uh, and it's doped uh, rather heavily, but I would still um, neglect the effect of trigonal working. So I will model my uh, thermal surface by a circle. One is a K point and another one is a K time point. So how we can, how we can make a note plot in this case, we can take two electrons, let's say from this side of one thermal surface, and transfer this pair to the other Fermi surface. And if we count the momentum, then the minimum condition for the umplots is that uh, if I start from two states here, then the total momentum is equal to minus two pf along this axis. And I need to bring them all the way here. That means that the momentum changes by the distance between k and k prime point, which on the Heineken lattice is one third of the brilliant zone size. And then it has a 2K of because I placed them here uh, on the top of the Fermi surface. So the change in the momentum is 4K of plus two thirds of the reciprocal lattice vector. And that has to be equal or larger than the reciprocal vector I itself. And that means that the Fermi momentum has to be larger than uh, 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 B over 12. And that's very hard to realize in real monolay graphene because it requires very strong uh, um, gating or doping, but it obtains in TDG because the super lattice R constant is much larger than the atomic lattice constant it's on the scale of 1500 angstroms. And this condition can be really be realized. Okay, so that was one condition, uh, which is was kind of obvious that we need to have a large enough Fermi surface. Another one, which is not that obvious, is that the momentum transfers a large enough. Why? Well, uh, suppose that we have a case of forward scattering when typical momentum transfers are much smaller than Kf, which by itself on the size of Kb. Uh, and we have a comfortably large uh, surface, let's say the copyright type, which I sketched here. Uh, we need to make sure that the mismatch between the initial and final momenta, which I now wrote in a little different way, but it's the same k prime plus p prime minus k and p equal to b. But the momentum transfers in each collision act, let's say between p and p prime, is equal to q and q is very small. And so if I neglect q in here, that means that the first term vanishes. And that means that uh, the difference between momenta p prime and p has to be close to the reciprocal of like this vector. This can be satisfied, but only at special points, which are unplugged special points, uh, shown by these dotted lines. And therefore, one would expect a suppression of unplugged spectrum. In conventional metals, uh, the Fermi surface is large enough, and momentum transfers are also are large enough. Both are of the order of uh, 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 Kf. Therefore, umplots are allowed. And when we see to square it in a conventional metal, such as aluminum, and the less conventional, but still conventional heavy fermion metal, uh, which is cerium aluminum three, when we see to square it in this thesis, we don't think twice. We say umplots, and we are very happy to see. However, our, our metal near PCP uh, provides us with a problem, uh, as I just told you. We have suppression uh, of uh, umplot scattering, and therefore one would expect that the actual scattering rate, which is the umplot rate, which enters the uh, uh, resistivity, is smaller than uh, than a naively estimated transfer rate, uh, uh, which scales as due to plus two over three. How small is small? Well, for that actually, it is uh, convenient to consider a special case of a thermal surface. Uh, following Patrick Lee uh, to introduce a two parameter. So, so I have this mismatch, um, the, the gap in momentum space, which the electrons have to cover in order to uh, produce an umplot R process. If delta B is of the order of B, which is the case of a generic Fermi surface, then 
can, uh, uh, we can certainly say that, that all of the inputs are suppressed. But suppose that the distance between the thermal surfaces, uh, the distance between the hot spots is small, smaller than B, then we have uh, another energy scale, which at quantum are criticality by itself scales as uh, the umplot mismatch to the power of three, and power of three is again the diameter exponent uh, of uh, the quantum phase uh, transition. So at higher temperatures, of course, smaller than the Fermi energy, but much larger than this, this intermediate scale, it, the umplot scattering rate is actually proportional to temperature. And if we go back to temperatures which are much smaller than this umplot energy scale, well, then the, then, then the umplot rate are scales as the squared, which means that they are back to a thermodynamic. So this is one of the ways to produce uh, a linear NT uh, uh, a linear NT of resistivity. Uh, 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 so that requires two uh, conditions. One to have a uh, Z equal to three quantum uh, critical point combined with a special kind of thermal surface where the distance between the input uh, points is small. All right, so that was about unplugs, but there are two warning signs here. Uh, is that uh, the T squared resistivity is also observed in low density semi-metals such as bismuth, graphite, antimony, and that violates the condition that the thermal momentum has to be comparable to like a uh, uh, constant. Uh, to, uh, it's actually much smaller than the size of the billion zone. And quantum critical scaling, uh, scaling uh, which we would uh, want to see in three dimensions, T to five, T to five thirds, is is observed in quantum critical ferromagnets such as uh, uh, palladium dot is nickel or zinc, uh, zinc azirconium 2, which relates the condition that momentum transfers has to be large. If they are quantum critical ferromagnets, uh, we expect that the momentum transfers are smaller than that. Okay, so this is a compilation of the data on the five thirds scaling uh, in quantum critical ferromagnets. Uh, this is uh, a system of palladium with, uh, with nickel. Palladium by itself is almost a ferromagnet, and it becomes ferromagnet if you add a little bit uh, of nickel, 0.026. And this critical concentration is shown uh, here. And the exponent is very close to 5 thirds, which is seen here because the resistivity is perfect to, uh, uh, as a temperature of 5 thirds. This is another system. Um, uh, this is zirconium zinc 2. And again, if you plot the resistivity, sorry for the mix, mix up of, of a reference, the resistivity are scales as T to five thirds. So, why does it happen? Um, well, there is one more condition which I mentioned that we either need umplugs or we need composite metals. And there is another scattering mechanism, which is specific to metals which are compensated. That means that they have equal number of leptons and poles. And it's known as Weber scattering, Weber who came up with this idea in 1937. And to understand this idea, uh, one can go to a very simple level of two parabolic bands. Uh, and uh, because we know that parabolic bands by themselves do not allow for current relaxation, uh, I will need to focus on the interband electric uh, electron electron uh, scattering. And the bands can be of the same sign, means two electron bands, or they can be of the opposite sign, means one electron and one whole band. And because I broke the Galilean invariance by saying that I have two bands, uh, the Galilean invariance system has only one band, I can allow myself to go back to the very simple level of equations of motion where uh, the change in the momentum in the first band is proportional to the driving force, which is the electric field, and charge E1 is charge in the first band. And I will describe uh, the interaction between the bands by this term, which has a friction nature. It's proportional to the difference of the velocities in the bands and to the number of the velocities in the other band. Gamma at this level is some phenological coefficient which characterizes the strengths. Uh, of uh, this friction. And the same equation for the second band, except for the change minus, minus the plus. So if we add up these two equations, the friction force will, uh, will, will, uh, will cancel 
as it should because this is the internal case. So I will multiply the first equation by the charge of the second band, the, uh, the, the second equation by the charge of the first band, subtract them off, and then we'll have a condition that the product of the total charge density times the difference of velocities must be equal to zero. And because we want to have some difference in, up in the velocities, uh, this is only possible if total charge density is equal to zero, which means our compensation. So because we're talking about electrons, E1 and E2 must be equal in magnitude to the electron charge. So that means that one of them, one of the bands must, must be electron-like and the other one is whole-like. And then it means that the number density has to be the same. The current is the sum of the currents in each of the bands. And under this condition of compensation, it's just proportional to the difference of the velocities. And we can find the difference of the velocities from either of the equations. It's proportional to the electric field. Therefore, the current is also proportional to, 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 to the electric field divided by the, by, uh, the friction R coefficient. Now, if we are in a thermal liquid, we would expect that the friction R coefficient is proportional to uh, the scattering rate, and then the conductivity is proportional to T squared, and therefore the resistivity is proportional to T squared. And if we are in a non thermal liquid, well, we can expect this T squared to change accordingly to the type of the quantum critical point and the dimensionality. So it is in this case, when the metal is compensated, uh, we don't need any help from moon clubs. Uh, we don't need impurities, we don't need phonons. Uh, in this case, the resistivity scales as it's supposed to uh, from um, you know, our uh, very naive uh, estimate. Uh, and actually, uh, this case sounds like a special case, but it, imply, it actually involves a wide class of our materials because all metals with even number of electrons per unit cells are compensated. They have equal number of electrons and are poles. And there are also semi-metals, bismuth, antimony, graphite, uh, while two uh, semi-metals such as uh, vanadium phosphorus two, parent states of iron-based superconductors are also compensated and they remain compensated on isovalent doping. Uh, big ferromagnets, actually, which I mentioned before, uh, which exhibit the quantum physical phenomena, at least these two also happen to be compensated. So uh, maybe the uh, evolution of the paradox, uh, uh, which I mentioned before, is that when we see a T squared in a low density system and T to five thirds in a uh, quantum critical system, this is the effect of compensation. Okay, so to summarize this part, um, if we talk about DC resistivity, it can be controlled by the interactions only in the presence of home clubs or compensation. Um, but do we really understand all cases of T squared um, um, of resistivity? Because not, of nothing is perfect, of course. Um, and the theory may have some R cracks, and the life of the theories would be really simple. And present, uh, if not uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, for experimentalists, uh, which keep challenging uh, our beloved notions, and these two particular gentlemen, um, uh, gentlemen, are uh, very good at uh, 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 challenging our notions. They uh, come up with examples when the T squared is observed when it is not supposed to be observed. And the game goes on as in tennis match. So uh, there are several balls thrown back and forth. Uh, one of them is the um, doped strontium titanium oxide, uh, also known as an STO. It has a tiny thermal surface. There is no possibility of wound clubs. Its band structure is well known. There is no compensation. Yet it shows to square it over a wide temperature range. Uh, one feature of this T squared that it goes through thermal energy, and therefore uh, it can really be the feature of a thermal liquid. So theorists, after the first shock, uh, thought a little bit and recalled that this is actually quantum paraelectric. It's very close to theoreticity, uh, but it doesn't quite make it, which means that it has a soft zero mode. A uh, single two of phonon scattering uh, is forbidden. Uh, because this mode is transverse, but one can scatter at two two phonons. 
And uh, if temperature is larger than the frequency of a telephonon, then the number of telephonons is proportional to temperature. And because I have, I need to have two phonons rather than one, the resistivity is proportional to this number of phonons squared, which is t squared uh, uh, over the sin uh, over some over some temperature range. Uh, theory kind of works in the sense that one has to ignore the fact that uh, the uh, frequency of a soft mode is uh, small on the order of 10 Kelvin uh, at low temperatures, but it's not uh, zero, it is finite. And uh, we should expect to see an exponential freeze out of resistivity in this range, we don't. But if we go above the telephone frequency, then indeed the theory based on the telephone scattering uh, works pretty well. And so for a while, theorists felt good about it. And I will just mention that uh, superconductivity due to two phonon mechanisms uh, will be discussed by uh, Premi Chandra and Dmitry Kiselev uh, Friday, uh, the last day of the workshop. Well, experimentalists don't keep us uh, 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 <coughs> lazy. They came up with another system, which is some. Uh, Bismuth oxide or selenium, and it's just a garden variety of semiconductor, doesn't have soft phonon modes, uh, and yet uh, it shows a really convincing T squared scaling. And our friends uh, 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 finished their paper by saying that our results, the absence, uh, our results imply the absence of a satisfactory understanding of the ubiquity of the T squared resistivity in thermal liquids. And this is how theorists feel about this. Uh, the ball is, uh, is on our side of the court. And for the time being, there is no explanation of this experiment. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, you have um, <clears throat> around uh, half an hour, Dmitry. Okay. <laughs> well, since, since I, I, I talked about DC transport, maybe, um, and then I'm going to switch. The optical inductivity, maybe it would make sense to uh, pause for a while and ask if there are any questions. I don't know if I would hear the audience, but maybe you can uh, convey the questions to me. Any questions from the audience? Uh, can I ask a question? <laughs> this is uh, Subir online. Yes, Hi. Yes, please, Subir. <laughs> uh, the very nice presentation. Uh, uh, Dimitri, uh, no, on the issue of compensation, if I take the memory function point of view, it would seem you know you need the momentum and the current to be orthogonal, and and that would require some symmetry between the two bands, not just equality of densities. Is that correct? No, not really. No, I don't know how to formulate this particular one in terms of matrix formalism, but uh, from the Boltzmann equation, there is no symmetry other than just compensation. Okay. I mean, but you're also assuming parabolic bands, so that's not important either. This is this this, this is just a toy model. Uh, uh, this yeah, but it's not, you don't think it's important. No, no, no. Okay, all right, thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Um, I have a question about the experimental data. I noticed that uh, the power law, that, uh, the T-square power law, the data was over about one decade and a little bit. Uh, is that convincing enough? What I thought. Um, okay, are you talking about the data which you see now? Yes, no, the data from the T square. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, well, it's T square. It, it, it's it's one decade um, in T square, right? So if you convert it into T, it's somewhat better than uh, 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 than it looks. But it has to be compared with other cases of T squared, when which we see in conventional metals, uh, such as the one which I showed in, or before. Uh, the range for T squared is always narrow in real systems because at high temperatures um, you have a contribution uh, from phonons, let's say T five, and then at low temperatures the resistivity is saturated. So in many cases, you don't see the squared at all, such as in copper, for example, or in uh, gold. And when you see the squared, 
uh, you may have a fraction of a decay, half, half of, of, of a decay. So compared to conventional metals, this T squared is better T squared than the silver. Yet, in conventional metals, it has to be there, and it doesn't have a place in this case. Uh, Mitya, and if I can ask you, what is T squared in this material? What is sorry, T sorry, what is sorry, sorry, what is Fermi energy in this material? Ah, okay. So as opposed to STO, uh, the temperature uh, it goes uh, up to the Fermi energy because the Fermi energy is about room temperature, three hundred Kelvin, and that's roughly the scale of the Fermi energy. So it doesn't have this feature which STO has that STO T squared goes to the Fermi energy without noticing it. So here we only know that it's T squared below the Fermi. So it may be that in this material is more conventional explanation works. Uh, except for we don't have one because it's a tiny Fermi surface in the, in, at the center of the brilliant zone uh, and there is no compensation. Okay, yeah. Uh, other questions? Uh, no questions. You can continue, Dmitry. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about optical conductivity. Uh, and I'll be focusing on high frequency regime when frequency is much uh, larger than the inverse transfer time, which by itself is a function of frequency and temperature. And in this regime, we expect the conductivity to scale as one omega squared. This is just coming from the formula. Proportional to the scattering rate, uh, uh, which uh, we need to figure out. And uh, I will start with the Kubo formula, which relates the real part of the conductivity to the imaginary part of the current current relation function. But instead of doing diagrams, as we normally do, I will use a trick, which uh, was invented probably by people who work in matrix uh, uh, formalism, in, mem in memory matrix formalism, uh, and in particular uh, by Akim Roche, where you start with this relation function, which, is integral, which contains integral over time, and you, and you integrate over time twice. Uh, that gives you a factor of one omega squared, and you replace the derivatives of uh, the current under the accumulation function by uh, the commutator of the current with the arc Hamiltonian, which is the exact, uh, the exact equation of motion. And then identically, the real part of the conductivity can be written as the imaginary part of a different arc correlator between the current and the arc Hamiltonian and the factor here changes to one or uh, one omega huge. Why it is convenient? Well, it's because if uh, some part of the current commutes with some part of the Hamiltonian, we don't need to worry about uh, this uh, process. It uh, drops out automatically, which somewhat simplifies uh, our life here. So the model which I'm going to consider uh, will be pretty generic. I will have the Hamiltonian, which contains some reaction band with arbitrary so far dispersion. And then I will write the interaction uh, uh, as uh, some general uh, function of k, p, and q, times the usual for Fermionic form. Uh, and I will not assume that uh, the, that that interaction is necessarily on the function of momentum transfer. If I do, that means that I'm back to density in, in, uh, interaction. But I can also allow this interaction to be proportional to some form factors, which depend on k and p. Per, for example, if interaction is keep uh, in the D-wave channel, then this form factor is the familiar cosine T x minus cosine T y. I single out a dimensionless complex constant G out of the R in out of the Hamiltonian just to make the uh, power counting simple. So for this Hamiltonian, I can write uh, other current by using the continuity equation. And it's a sum of two parts. One is just uh, the free electron W a free electron operator, which contains uh, the velocity. Uh, and for this kind of interaction, which is not dense to density, there is another part which contains the gradients of, of, of the interaction, which are non-zero if I have this form factors. Now, uh, if I want to obtain my real part of the conductivity to second order in the interaction, I need the uh, correlation function 
uh, I mean, they are commutator between uh, the current and the and other Hamiltonian to linear order energy because the conductivity by itself is uh, a product of two peaks. So if my current is a three one plus the interacting part and the Hamiltonian is the three one plus the interacting part uh, to linear order in G, I have two, uh, two accommodators uh, of the free current here with the interaction part of the Hamiltonian and of the interaction part of the, of, uh, the Hamiltonian of the current with the accommodator. Let me focus on the first one. If we do our operator algebra, we end up with this form of the R commutator, which is very telling. So, and what is telling is this combination of at the velocities, which is total velocity in the final state minus total velocity in the initial state. As you see here, uh, the uh, interaction uh, is outside of this um, uh, bracket. So, um, mm -mm. Uh, uh, it can be anything here. Now, if the system is Galilean invariant, just for a second, uh, that means that uh, the velocity is just equal to the momentum over the mass. And in this case, this velocity imbalance vanishes identically. Okay, that's what we already know. The real part of the conductivity in this case will be just a delta function of the frequency. If the dispersion is not parabolic, but isotropic, suppose Dirac as linear, the imbalance of the velocity is not zero, but it's small. It's proportional to a uh, factor of either frequency or temperature, whichever is large. And why is it so? Well, if the dispersion is isotropic, I can write the, uh, um, the velocity as a vector, uh, as vector of the momentum, multiplied by the derivative of the dispersion divided by the magnitude of the momentum. Uh, if I project all the momenta of the initial and final states onto the Fermi surface, make them equal to Kf, then the common factor which depends on the, on the magnitude uh, is taken out. And what I have now is a vanishing combination due to momentum conservation. So if I, my system is non-parabolic, but I project it onto the Fermi surface. I still have zero uh, for the uh, conductivity. Uh, one needs to expand near the Fermi surface. Okay. And understandably, um, I'm not sure that my okay, sorry, uh, the, the order was. <clears throat> okay. Trying to understand what happens with my slides here. Okay, so um, if we expand near the Fermi surface, uh, well, we need to uh, go uh, in energy uh, uh, away from the uh, Fermi energy. And that means that uh, the imbalance of velocities will be proportional to, let's say, factor of uh, frequency. Because the conductivity is a product. Uh, of two accelerators, uh, then it gives an extra factor of omega squared in the uh, conductivity. Uh, and this is the result of the conductivity, um, which has uh, an additional omega four in here, or T4, depending on what is larger, uh, as opposed to the Fermi liquid region, where we have omega squared or T. Uh, so, so Dimitri, if I can interrupt for a minute, sure. uh, you had a two slides ago. You had a K one and a K two. What happened to the K two? Ah, um, okay, okay. So this is K two, but K two uh, contains just uh, the just um, um, just the difference uh, of the final energies and the initial energies because you commute the Hamiltonian, which contains uh, the dispersion with the, um, uh, the interaction part of other current. But this interaction happens in the presence of a photon. So the difference in the energies is just equal to the energy of the photon. And so in this case, uh, K2 uh, is proportional to the factor of frequency. And therefore, the conductivity has an extra factor of frequency squared. Okay. 
Uh, okay, thanks. All right. Um, this factor lambda is uh, a measure of non probability it contains some combination of other derivatives of, of other dispersions such that if we uh, go back to the parabolic case, we get zero. For the Dirac case, we get one, and whatever uh, the dispersion uh, is as, as long as, as it deviates from the non-parabolic, uh, it's some number. And then if we use our quantum critical interaction here, uh, 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 I would count uh, three factors of uh, the population lengths in, in three dimensions, and four factors of the accumulation lengths in two dimensions, in the, which, which is simply the scaling dimension uh, of, of the integral over here. Um, the two-dimensional case also has a log, which is kind of interesting because it's a transport, and we normally say that transport doesn't have logs. Uh, I can explain it uh, if, 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 uh, if there will be a question. Okay, so in terms of transport scattering train, and forgetting about law, then the transport rate scales as omega 4, 44, both in two and three uh, dimensions. This suppression is common for uh, any, uh, any dimensionality. Uh, 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 it, it's only a factor of a law uh, uh, using the two. So if I would not bravely continue this result, to uh, the quantum critical point, then I have to replace omega four by uh, omega two minus four thirds, and then counting my powers, I will end up with the conductivity, which scales as omega two thirds times log omega in two in, uh, in, uh, dimensions. Sorry, Dmitry, can you talk louder, please? Okay, uh, from which point? Uh, from now on. From now on. Oh. I don't need to repeat anything. I think we're good. Okay, thank you. So that's really omega two thirds, not minus two thirds. As no, no, it's really. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's really omega two thirds. And uh, the naive scattering rate would give omega two minus two thirds. Okay. And then uh, there's a special case. Uh, um, uh, of a convex Fermi surface in two dimensions. And this subject actually has very long history, as many things in transport. Uh, it started with Gurji back in 1980, who noticed that um, the relaxation of odd harmonics of the distribution function, including the first harmonic, which gives us uh, the current, is slow on a two-dimensional convex Fermi surface. And then there was lots of people who work on this. And even recently, we have two papers from Central's group and from Suger's group. Uh, uh, they just got this same subject. So uh, I, I wasn't going to talk about it um, originally, but uh, because the subject still seems to be of, 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 of an interest, I will. And if you are like me, always confusing convex and concave, so just to just to avoid uh, my mistake, uh, this is a convex Fermi surface. This is a concave Fermi surface. I hope that I did it right. And um, the difference is that the second one has inflection points, and the first one doesn't. Okay, so um, we want to have final conductivity, and ideally we would want to have them from electrons right on the Fermi surface, because if we go away from the Fermi surface, we have to pay uh, energy. Which means that uh, we have to specify uh, three conditions. Um, the imbalance of the velocities must not be equal to zero, otherwise, there will be no current at relaxation. The initial state and the final state of two electrons must be on a different surface. So, that it, it, it is a purely a geometric problem, which I can solve in uh, the following way I can pre label um, P into minus P for the P bar. Uh, and then because I have kind of a symmetry, um, the equation for P bar is the same as um, the equation for P, which means that it is uh, the same equation. So geometrically, when we solve, let's say, first equation for K, what we do, we take a Fermi contour and we shift it to momentum space by momentum transfer Q. 
And then once we change our view, we shift again and we find the solutions that is the positions of the initial states on the thermal surface, which allow for um, uh, energy momentum conservation. Well, the property of a concave thermal surface, did I say concave, convex, okay, sorry, convex thermal surface, that uh, it has only two uh, self intersection points if you move it in a plane. Which means that um, the other equation for K has two roots. Let's call them one of them is going to be K naught, but then the other one by symmetry is minus K naught plus Q. But the equation for the other fermion, which we now label by P bar, is the same, which means it has also two solutions P naught bar minus P naught bar plus Q, or if I go back to the original momenta, it's minus P naught P naught plus Q. But that means that the two sets must coincide because they came from other same equation. And there are only two choices. First member of the set has to be equal to the first member of this set. But that means that we're in the Cooper channel or head on our collision when the momentum of the initial states are opposite to each other. But that means that the total R velocity is equal to zero. And the final R velocity is equal to zero, and there is no R current in the initial state, there is no current in the final state, not of nothing to be relaxed. So the factor of delta V is equal to zero. Or we can swap our momentum. The first member of this set is equal to the second member of this set, and vice versa. Okay, but if I rewrite my velocity imbalance in a slightly different form, just after arranging the terms. Here is the difference between the initial state and the final state of the, of the second electron, but because we had swapped, they're the same. So this is equal to zero. And the same for this term. So it means that if I have this final state, this initial state, its final state coincides with the initial state of the other, of, uh, the, uh, of other electrons. That means that the leading term, in the rotation rate or in optical conductivity or in DC conductivity in the presence of impurities vanishes. If we are in a Fermi liquid, then uh, we would expect to have a omega squared T squared term. Well, it doesn't happen on a convex Fermi surface, it goes away by this uh, hidden integrability of the Fermi surface. And the next order term is omega 4 T4, which is the same for a non parabolic but isotropic spectrum. Which I talked about before. Subleading term for the non Fermi liquid uh, was obtained recently uh, in Sibir's group, uh, who uh, said that uh, it is as in a Fermi liquid, it's proportional to omega squared. Um, I will not uh, comment on this further. I think this is to be discussed. Okay, now. What happens if the, if the Fermi surface is concave? Well, uh, if we slide a concave Fermi contour by momentum transfer in the plane, we are guaranteed to have more than uh, two self intersection points. So let's say there are n of these points, it means that there are n larger than two solutions of uh, the energy conservation. Uh, Two out of this n will be trivial Cooper and swap channels, they do not contribute, and there is no current other relaxation. Uh, the remaining channels uh, will contribute, and in the Fermi liquid, I uh, will uh, recover the, uh, the usual omega squared T squared law. And if we, are, if we continue with this to a quantum critical point, once we have a Fermi liquid omega squared T squared, and we know the times in power, then this should give us um, omega to minus two third for the conductivity, which was which was anticipated back uh, uh, in mid uh, mid, uh, mid 90s, was calculated uh, by some uh, partial set of diagrams uh, by Andre and myself, and, and uh, it was done in our case under the assumption that uh, the Fermi surface does not allow does, does not allow for a conservation. Uh, same result would be for, for optical conductivity would be, would be obtained for a compensated case, 
uh, in, in this case, uh, 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 you don't need even uh, uh, convexity. Uh, the Fermi surface can be a circle, but it's enough to have two circles. And if you move two circles simultaneously, you get more than two solutions. And in this case, the conductivity scales as predicted by naive estimate of the state of the Okay, um, I wanted to stop here by thanking people who worked with me on a number of projects, which I, I mentioned here. And this is Andrei Chubukov, uh, Vladimir Litson, and Alexander Kuchipi, and also uh, former members uh, of my group at UF, Pidish Pao, Abhishek Kumar, and Song Simpli, and Prachi Sharma. And with this, I will uh, put my summary in, and I will be happy to take questions. Okay, so let us thank the speaker. Uh, questions, please. Uh, so, uh, Dmitry, there is a question in the chat. I yeah, think. I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Uh, in order to see it, I probably need to stop uh, I need to stop sharing. Um, okay. Um, right. Uh, question is: Can we generalize this effect? Uh, this probably means. Uh, cancellation uh, on the convex Fermi surface. Right. Okay. Uh, between two concave bands, for example, does it affect the conductivity as well? Well, um, so if you have concave uh, Fermi surface, uh, then cancellation doesn't happen. And, and as I just said at the end, probably too fast, uh, if I have uh, two convex Fermi surfaces, and uh, uh, this, this is enough to avoid a constellation. Did that answer the question? But to compensate the convex, right? Um, no, actually, um, uh, for the optical conductivity, you don't even need compensation. It's enough to have two bands. You wouldn't get final DC at resistivity without a compensation. But optical conductivity will be fine at high enough frequencies. Other questions? Uh, no questions. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And this concludes our session today. Thank you, everyone, for participation. Have a good evening session. Thanks. Thank you. Have a minute. Sure. I'll let me switch this on.